Hello, a few days ago in the department, myself and Dr. Karen Kilby found ourselves discussing the role of the five ways which occur in Thomas Aquinas's great work, The Summa Theologiae, and we were chatting about what these famous five ways might mean. And it struck us that the discussion we were having then was a discussion that would be would make a very interesting film. Karen, you had a, a very simple but a very profound observation on the five ways. So over to you. Uh, okay, be before I make that though, I'd like to say w w what fundamentally fascinates me about the five ways is a sense of huge discrepancy between how they're perceived by most of the world and what you find when you read them in the Summa Theologiae. Because m many people, if they've heard of Thomas Aquinas at all, will have done it because they say, oh yes, he's the five ways man. Or if they're studying philosophy and ethics at A level, they might read the five ways as one of the proofs of the existence of, one of the ways of proving the existence of God that they study and pick apart and question whether it works or not. So there tends to be the thing, Thomas Aquinas's purpose in life was in large part to prove the existence of God, and he's given us these five ways, and that's his major contribution. This is, this is the way it can go down when people have just a little bit of contact. And what really interests me is, I was looking yesterday, I have a five-volume version of the Summa Theologiae, and the first volume is 580 pages long, and the bit with the five ways in it is just under a page and a half. So it's a page and a half out of something close to 3,000 pages. Um, so you begin to think, did it have the importance in Thomas Aquinas's mind that it has in students of philosophy's mind today? W what did he think he was doing? Um, now, the observation that you mentioned, so it's the five ways are in a single article of a single question of the Summa, which again, I counted recently, I think it's over 500 questions the Summa has in total. Each question is broken into a number of articles, two, three, eight, ten, it can vary. So there's a single article devoted to the question whether God exists. And after his usual pattern of raising some objections and introducing a quote from the Bible, Thomas Aquinas says uh, something like, the existence of God can be proven in five ways, and hence the famous five ways, a page and a half. Um, so my observation is, if he'd really been interested in these as proofs, as thought is really significant, the way we tend to think it is, have I got a good proof or not, then surely he'd have given at least a separate article to each of the five ways. He'd have given a whole question to how we prove the existence of God. Because if something is put in an article, then you can consider objections to it, you can answer objections. The structure of the Summa is set up in this sort of dialectical way. So my, my first hypothesis is perhaps he wasn't very interested in them, at least in their quality as arguments, or he'd have given them more time, individual attention. Karen, to move on to your second point. So um, the, the, the five ways do come very early in the summer, but they don't come right at the beginning. And it's fascinating if you look what comes before the five ways, because first of all, there's a kind of methodological discussion in question one, which already presumes the existence of God, the nature of salvation, the nature of God's knowledge. Um, it presumes that we have revelation and so on. So you start to think, this is quite strange. Why assume all these things before you know whether God exists? And then even at the beginning of question two, before you get to the article that asks whether God exists, there's a previous question. Well, there's two previous questions, but one of them is whether it can be demonstrated that God exists. So before these proofs come out, Thomas has already raised and answered the question can, it be, can, can God's existence be demonstrated? He already knows that it can be demonstrated. Now, to, to a modern perspective, this looks very strange. If you want to know whether something can be de demonstrated, then you've got to demonstrate it. You don't know before you've done it that it can be demonstrated. It, it looks, and also he's, he's quoting the Bible right and left. So you either have to say this is one very confused man who doesn't know how to order his writings properly, or that he's not doing what we tend to suppose he must be doing, which is laying a rational basis for everything that's going to follow. That he's, he's not as concerned as we are, that he has to first prove that God exists before he can do anything else. He's not trying to lay his foundations or to justify what he's doing. So 
My own interpretation is uh, um, quite simple, that um, what he's doing is he's asking, what is the status of our knowledge of God? Someone like Anselm thinks we, we have kind of necessary knowledge. We can know from, from first principle, we can sort of the existence of God is undeniable. It's self-evident in Thomas's terms. And he raises that possibility. He says, no, not for us. It's not self-evident. But we do know about God from the world. We look around the world. We can reason to God. And that's, he's, he's settled his position on that. And just as a kind of appendix, he says, well, if I say that we can, then what are the proofs? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of proofs. Not too concerned. The main point is I'm not taking Anselm's line. I'm taking this different line. So I see the proofs as just gathering up some things that are around that everyone knows. These are the kind of proofs that you use. And just for the sake of completeness, uh, listing them after he's established that that's the way that one can know that God exists. Now, this is, this is a very minimalist reading that I'm taking, and I know that it's, it's not quite enough from your perspective. So, so tell well, me what you think. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that he gives the question, an est Deus, which we always translate, does God exist? But, and that is a perfectly legitimate way to read the, to read the Latin an est Deus. But I suspect that when we use the, when we ask the question, does God exist? from at least the 15th century onwards, I think we, ha we actually are asking a slightly different question to the question that Augustine, Anselm and Aquinas are asking. We ask the question, does God exist? And we could convert that question into the form, how many gods are there? And how many gods are there? Well, does the answer, many? No. No god, zero. Oh, there's one, and it's almost like you're, you're ticking the box. Yes, we have one of these. Now, for, for Aquinas, the idea that God doesn't exist is just not, not a possibility. And therefore, it's not a question of how many gods. Oh, yes, we've got one, and here's the proof that we've got one, which is you know, a very modern notion of proof but it's rather, let's demonstrate what it means to say there is a God so that I will know something about the reality of God. And uh, from my point of view, the, the word demonstrate, the, the verb demonstrare, to demonstrate, is not a case of a demonstration in the mathematical sense, but a demonstration in the sense of, well, let's show what we mean by this word. So at the end of the five ways, he doesn't say, therefore, God exists. We would love it to end up, therefore, God is. He says, well, we see that there's, that there's motion. There must be a first, within a, within a creation, there must be a first mover. And we will call this God. And this we call by the name God. So it's... It's the more profound question, not how many gods are there, but what is it for me as a creature to say there is a god? And okay, that can look a very cyclical argument, but this is, this is the, it takes theology back into an exploration of what it means to believe and not to engage in some sort of well, I can prove to you that there is one of these things. And I think that's a, a richer way to, to read the five ways. Mm -hmm. So we're probably not actually um, at odds with each other. Well, I think one thing that where I would take issue with is that I'm not sure actually that Anselm, I think Anselm was engaged in the exactly the same question in that for Anselm, uh, what does it mean to say God is? It means to say he is in such a way that his, his very is, to be this thing, is to be the sort of thing that cannot not be. Mm -hmm. Whereas we tend to think of it in terms of self-referential knowledge or a, 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 a self-proving proposition. Mm -hmm. We tend to come at it... So it's, like Anselm is, is talking more about the nature of God's being than the nature of how we yeah, know about it. Like there's... Like the, um, there's that story in Bertrand Russell that he, he goes down to the shop one day to buy a tin of tobacco. 
And while he's in buying a tin of tobacco, and he, he comes to philosophy and he comes to theology with his background on mathematics and logic. And suddenly he thinks, oh, maybe the, maybe, maybe the ontological argument works. And he's, he's very worried, and he's walking back, and suddenly he says he flicked the, the tin of tobacco in the air and caught it again and says, no, nope. he sees the flaw in the argument again. Now that's the way you play with a, that's the way you play with a, uh, with a demonstration in mathematics, where it's uh, the closest a lot of people would come to it is sort of solving a Sudoku problem. Um, whereas for, for, for Anselm and for Aquinas, it's to explore what, given, given what we know about being, which is the utter finitude of our being, can we think of any way that we could think of a being that would have being in a different way? And, and if we could think of it in that way, for answer, well, imagine let's think of a being that couldn't not be. And Aquinas says, well, I'm not sure I can think of that sort of a being. But I can think of a being that would be an ultimate mover. OK, well, that sort of a being, well, we can call that God. What's interesting, though, Aquinas doesn't quite think Anselm's wrong about God, but he thinks that God is, as he puts it in the first article of Question 2, God is self-evident to God, but not to us. So, yes, so, that lovely distinction. Which it's, it's, known, it's, it's not known in itself, but it's, no, it's known as far as it is towards us. Uh -huh. uh, and I think, actually, that, that brings out something that's absolutely to my mind, fundamental about Aquinas' approach. You never think you can leave your own creatureliness and your own limitation in doing theology. Karen, uh, the five ways will no doubt be used for the next thousand years as some sort of knockdown, um, but thank you for trying to open up that there's a different way of looking at the, there are five ways, not five knockdown proofs. Mm -hmm. And thanks for coming here today. Thank you.